Okay, I'm from Transition Brogwine, um, which is part of the Transition Network, and we run a surplus food project, but a surplus food project that is different from the other surplus food pro... You can't hear, right? It's, oh, <laughs> um, that is different from other surplus food projects around the country because for us, um, carbon reduction is our main aim. We do address food poverty, but our prime purpose, as for all transition groups, is carbon reduction, community resilience, and developing more sustainable lifestyles. Can I check? For, I hate talking to audiences. Um, I much prefer, if you want to ask me a question, just ask me, stick your hand up, shout, whatever. Um, I much prefer a conversation than standing here talking at you. But I'll do this first bit. But I'll throw a question at you. How many of you actually know what the transition movement is and does? OK. Oh, it's a <laughs> least winner. Transition movement, for those of you who, who don't, is, was set up about 10 years ago um, by a guy called Rob Hopkins. It's now international. It's, there are transition groups from New Zealand to Brazil to India, all over the world. And what they're about is basically concern about climate change, um, that's how it started, the need for carbon reduction. Um, and, um, but, but gradually over the years, it, it's evolved, it's, it's changing. Um, because what I think people who were coming together to be part of the transition movement realized was that green environmentalists tend to spend most of their time talking to other green environmentalists that we don't get our message out into the community very well. Um, and what the transition movement has moved into is to say, Rob Hopkins says it in his new book, just go out there and do things. Set up things. Don't sit around having awareness raising meetings or film shows. Do that, but as well, you just need to get out there and set up meaningful examples, visible, meaningful examples of community action which helps to reduce carbon. Okay, so we thought, all right, so what are we going to do? And we had two members who had small holdings, one pigs, one chickens, and they were going around the local shops collecting food and finding that there was masses of stuff being thrown away. Perfectly good stuff was going off to landfill. Um, so as a group, we thought, well, let's find out from the community what they want to do with this surplus food. So we held a couple of pilot lunches. We put on two meals. We invited dignitaries to one, but local people to the other, and asked them. And what came out of that? We thought it might be a food bank. But what came out of it was they wanted a community cafe, somewhere where people could come together, get cheap, healthy meals, and reduce waste in the area. So we thought, all right, <laughs> all right, that's what we'll do. Um, but where to do it? Well, first and foremost, the co-op. We went and talked to the co-op, who are really the big supermarket in Fishguard. Fishguard's only tiny, 5,000 people. And um, the manageress was really supportive, but couldn't give us any food. But they gave us this building. It was pretty derelict when we got it, but it was in a really good spot, right by the co-op. Um, and uh, innocence, that, that was it inside. It looks better than it was. That was pretty filthy. The floor was absolutely awful. Um, the windows were rotted. But we thought, oh no, we can do this. We can turn this into a cafe with no money. Um, so we started. We went round and we got a group of volunteers and we got people from oh, uh, juicens and all sorts of places to give us things, give us the floor paint. Oh, that was Milford Haven Port Authority gave us the floor paint um, and the scree. We put up these walls. 
but it was still a long way from being acceptable to environmental health. So one of my colleagues, Anne here, went and chatted up the guys at Wix. And that's her telling the guy at Wix what we wanted in there. The kitchen, the flooring, the wall tiles. And they said yes. I think we got about £5,000 worth of stuff from Wix. Here it is, starting to go in. And we're starting to look a bit more, a bit cleaner, a bit healthier. And uh, the Wix did the flooring for us, but we had to put in the kitchen cupboards and the tiling. That's me grouting. I learned all sorts of skills during this process. Okay, so there we are. And we started being given things. And Environment Wales, we're registered. We've been registered with Environment Wales for some time, and they give us funding for things. They decided that this looked like it might be a project that would uh, meet their criteria. So we got about £10,000 from them to buy equipment. A lot of this was these tables that are in a pile there because we kept get, getting given stuff and didn't have anywhere to store it, so it went into the building. But the, um, the fridges, the cookers, we got them very cheap from a cafe that was closing down, the tables we were given. Um, and, oh, loads of meetings, <laughs> loads and loads of meetings, as you can imagine. But this is, this is just a small number of the volunteers. At that point, we had about 50 volunteers, or about 30 now, but about 50. But because this appealed to people at a, a number of levels, people were interested in it because of the whole issue about carbon reduction. They were also interested in it because lots of people don't like waste food. There were people, some of the builders here just wanted to, you know, were happy to come and do something for the community because they knew that this derelict empty building was going to be used and turned into a cafe and community centre. So we did, we had, um, and still have a wonderful selection of people who, um, help with all the various bits of it but yes this was one of the many meetings to plan it and here it is coming together that's the that's the kitchen with the, some of the equipment in it's we still weren't up and running then but the cooks these are two of these were qualified chefs who came and gave us their time voluntarily to train up a lot of our volunteers and one was a trainee baker and they were working out um systems for the kitchen um, because obviously we had to meet environmental health standards so we had to get our HACCPs into place um, we had to be seen by environmental health we got grade five we got grade five um, so so yes they uh, they started and they started planning the menu we started looking at what food was likely to be coming in um, and they started cooking and here is us practicing on our friends. <laughs> um, these are a group of uh, supporters and friends who came in and we, we tried out our meals on them. We didn't get open for a couple of months after this, even though we were ready, because while the local authority planning department had been wonderful, uh, allocated us our own planning officer to help us through, uh, the process because they recognised what such such innocence we were. Um, the building regs guy was a bit of a monster and uh, he delayed us by about three months before we met his standards. But anyway, there we were. That's, that's up until the point at which we opened. Any questions so far? Because I had intrigued about how you actually started up in the first place because this seems like quite a big undertaking really I mean did you have money behind you did you have a rent on this place I mean, really, how did you no the co-op gave it to us rent free they still pay all our electricity we, we've said to them you, know, <laughs> you haven't cut us off we're still getting the electricity um, it was low I worked out that the 
professional uh, input that we had, like from Wix and all the other small builders and people, came to about £10,000. Um, but no, the rest of it was volunteer labour, which for one year we estimated was, uh, you estimate volunteer labour at £6.50 an hour, um, and that it came to 32000 so a lot of volunteer labour. People just, this project, of all the projects Transition has ever tried, is the one that's really grabbed the community. People j just think it makes sense. Uh, committees fill me with dread at the best of times, but and voluntary committees tend to transcend all the worst parts of any committee. So how have you uh, managed to uh, make it work? <laughs> um, our Environment Wales Development Officer says we are very unusual in that we've got a group of people who uh, don't just talk, but actually go out and do. Um, and I think we're a bit ruthless that if we find people who are just getting in the way and a bit of a waste of time, we, we set up subcommittees. <laughs> we have a set, no, we set up subcommittees that actually do the work. Uh, uh, but, okay, I'll move on then and show you. So, yeah, this was a year and a bit ago. We've now been open for just over a year. Okay. How does it work? Right, well, we have an, a team of volunteers that are called the acquisitions team. Uh, on the left here, this is Mim, who had a car accident as a young man and um, is disabled, but with his carer, uh, is part of the acquisitions team. We've got about three or four, Anne's also, she coordinates it. They go around to local shops, um, and now the co-op give us a bit of food. They're still hyper-anxious about giving food. Um, but bookers give us food. Um, so they do a collection, more or less, every day, one or other of the team, and bring it into the building. Um, we also get a lot of food from local people. This is an old guy who regularly brings us apples. He did yesterday again. So, but, yeah, the community turn up with lots of fresh fruit and veg as well. Okay. Um, and this is where, this is the sorting room. This is fairly early days. These photos were taken over a whole period of time. Um, so this is where the food comes in and is stacked on shelves. If you saw this now, it's just absolutely heaving. We have got so much. We've got this big freezer here that we can also store surplus in. We, we up until very recently, we just kept paper records of everything, which was a nightmare. Trying to keep your stock in control with just paper records. But with the money we want to pay, we're now setting up a proper um, spreadsheet and computerised system. So that's the sorting room. Um, and then whatever food, it all has to be checked in, all has to be recorded for environmental health purposes. It's quite a big job. Um, and then it goes through into the kitchen where it's cooked. Um, here, Sarah, with the redhead scarf, is a local solicitor who loves cooking and comes in once a week. The other two are two young people from Jobs Growth Wales. We've got, uh, at the moment we have three young people through Jobs Growth Wales. No, no. Because Rose, Rosie here uh, in the red jumper um, came to us as a volunteer, then was with us for six months as a Jobs Growth Wales young person, and now we're managing to employ her part time. We can't afford it full time yet, we're not making enough. Faye got experience with the blue hair, got experience and went and got a job at, on the vans, the burger vans in the festivals this summer, um, but was able to use her experience to get the job. Um, and they cook the sort of things that we cook. There's always, there's often quiches, loads of salads, always lots of different salads. Uh, soup on the menu every day and always puddings. That's a typical menu. So, curry pasta or soup. And with red currant dressing, oh, that's a good one. Yes, pasta bake, root vegetable, um, chili bean stew, 
rhubarb crumble and cream and yeah always some cakes so that's that but the menus change all the time because it just depends what's coming in and we never know what's going to come in so the cooks have to be very very creative um, and sometimes we end up with some rather odd dishes but there we go um, and here's the cafe itself this is how it looks now um, and this is group is fairly typical. Um, we've got the guy sitting in, in the green yellow shirt is a long time supporter so we always have our supporters coming in. Um, the people that I'm talking to in the corner were people who just wanted to find out about what we were about and we get a fair number of people and that's really good and they ask us all sorts of questions like well where do you get this food from and how old is it and well is it all right to eat food that's past its best before date well yes it is um, and here Sarah by the desk is from a local um, organization we have a lot of organizations come in um, and support us hold meetings with us and here's another view of the cafe. Um, again, family with young children. We get quite a lot of families with young children and we're trying to uh, do lots of work with them. Um, and quite a lot of tourists being where we are. The, the guy here talking to one of the volunteers is a German tourist who saw the word transition, knew about the transition movement, came in and wanted to find out about all the things we do. And of course, we don't just talk about the cafe, we talk about all the other sustainability, sustainable uh, projects we've got going. We've just got planning permission to put up a community wind turbine. That's another subgroup of DBG, um, which will make money for the community. Um, yeah, um, we hold lots of events and meetings, and I've got a picture few here. That's us out doing a demonstration at Fishguard Show. Uh, that's us making pizzas with kids at another show. This is some um, school children coming in from the local school. Do you remember earlier people were saying kids aren't interested in food? We don't find that at all. This lot really loved sessions they came and did with us last year and the school are bringing them back again this year. Um, <laughs> this is our two young jobs growth work. and Rosie, both of these were good cooks but Rosie is a fantastic cook um, but they've made this poster for us because as well in the cafe we hold events, Seedy Saturday was a seed swap day so people who had got spare seeds back in uh, March or wherever it was brought them and swapped We've had a jazz session in there, a folk when it was Fishguard Jazz Festival. Uh, that's our Christmas, one of our Christmas meals. We did three Christmas meals. Um, and yeah, that's it. And at the moment, they are running a climate change lunch with rather charred puddings <laughs> to represent what might happen if we don't address climate change <laughs> because this Tuesday is a UN climate summit and so we signed up with AVAZ, we're one of the AVAZ events, AVAZ being that big international movement that is concerned about climate change um, and yes, at the moment I must give them a ring and find out how they've got on but they're running that event and they're persuading, trying to persuade customers to sign the Avaz petition, which I hope you all will do too. <laughs> okay. And how many people do you have them coming in? And let's say somebody came for uh, a bowl of soup and a quiche, how much would it cost? Bowl of soup and quiche would, and the salad would come with the quiche, that would cost you £4.50. £1.50 for the soup and £3 for the quiche and salad. So Yes, but what we really, really um, concerned about um, is that the whole waste food movement is beginning to see, be seen as something that is for poor people only. 
Well, that's another issue, isn't it? It's a huge issue. Some people won't come because they think if they're seen coming in here, it will mean to the rest of the community they're on benefits or they're poor. And I think it's a really big issue because the people who waste most food are not the poor. The poor don't enough, have enough food to waste. Um, it's, it's, it's the middle classes, it's the wealthy, and that's why we've worked very hard to make it a community cafe and to make sure that we attract a real cross-section of people, and we do. So what would other communities need to be able to follow your example? I mean, could this, is it something about Fishguard that means you all know each other? So no. Like, or could this be spread into other towns? Oh, it could be spread into other towns, and I think it would be easier in a big urban area, because we are small, and we do actually have a lot of cafes in, in Fishguard. Um, and that was why we were surprised that the community, wa community wanted another community cafe. But yes, I think it could be spread into other areas, but you do need a good group of committed people. So do you need, with all due respect, do you need people who uh, have spare time or, don't, or can afford to not work? Or do you need that? Well, a lot of our volunteers are people who are unemployed and are seeking work experience. We started off, um, that's what transition was like, it's not anymore, because we have attracted um, a whole range of, of different people who come for a variety of reasons. Would anyone else like to join in on this discussion? Hi, I had a couple of questions, but I think you've answered them, but the one uh, particularly about what your market is and perceptions around whether you're just providing for those in poverty. But what, what did the other cafe owners in Fishguard think? Because presumably there's an element of thinking, hey, this is unfair competition. Yeah. And are you having to be a little bit more aggressive in the way that you market yourself or position yourself in order to, to, you know, to be a viable enterprise in, in Fishguard? We didn't want to alienate the rest of the community, um, so we don't advertise how cheap we are outside, and we're not very aggressive at advertising the cafe, but we do a lot of work about all the various events that we put on. So, you know, like you saw CD Saturday, um, we've done various evening meals with speakers, um, other groups use us, and we provide the food. We've had the lifeboat, um, so uh, RNLI did a fundraising event there. So how we market ourselves is as a community venture which has got this cafe which serves food which fits into our principles of, of reducing carbon by not wasting food. So it's, we, we don't want to be seen just as a normal cafe. We want to be seen as more than that. We're about sustainability, carbon reduction. Um, and so while some people come in just because we are cheap and they can get a cheap cup of tea and a meal, and the, we do, we have a number of people who clearly are in poverty, or we've got quite a lot of genteel poor, older people who clearly haven't got a lot, and very careful about what they spend, even at our prices. But, um, Yeah. Presumably, you want to become more mainstream. <laughs> not, I don't mean mainstream, but okay, attractive to why people come to you for lots of reasons rather than just the equity. Yes. Yeah. Um, we, we need to make more money if we're going to be able to employ all the young people we would like to keep on when they finish their Jobs Growth Wales six months with us. Um, and we'd like to be less reliant on grants. We um, or funding like from Hay or Environment Wales. But what we don't, we're not there to become a business and make a lot of money. That's never been our aim. Our aim is always carbon reduction. And what excites me about it is that we're a very different business model. We're a model that is about not just making money, but is about. Um, 
gifting. People give us things all the time. Community exchange. We do things for a group. The writers group come and use our building. A sewing group uses our building. The sewing group mends our aprons and makes us headscarves. And the writers group writes material for us. So we're trying to develop a different economic model. I've heard a lot today about, you know, having to grow, that Wales wants its food industry to grow by, was it 30%? We're about saying, actually, if we're going to live in a more sustainable world, this growth agenda is not healthy. Sustainability and continuous growth don't match. Um, we're saying this is a different model. You can actually set something up like this and run it using recycling, gifting, community exchange, but you do still have to make money. <laughs> uh, oh, I never answered your question. Sorry, I, will I never answered your question about what the other cafes think. There's one cafe down the road doesn't like us, um, who says we're undercutting them. Um, but most of the others... Um, recognize that the food we serve is significantly different because it's mainly vegetarian. Uh, it's not chips and burgers and what most of the other cafes serve. Um, and lots of them recognize that we're actually, we've had a lot of really good publicity and people are coming into Fishguard to see what we're doing. So most of the cafe owners are not against us. In fact, three of them are helping us. Um, but yeah, we do have one lot of moments. <laughs> Sorry. Um, firstly, fantastic project. Uh, I think you've, you know, you've all done um, extremely well to get Thank off the ground. You. I can only imagine the bureaucracy that was involved. Um, Mark, I've got a hypothetical question. So we're all uh, hoping, you know, to see a world one day where there is no food waste. Let's just hypothetically say in kind of 10 years time, yes. we win, zero food waste. Where would you see your, your cafe? Kind we'll of be out of business going? and that's fine. <laughs> I can have a rest. <laughs> no, we've always said that, that, you know, ideally um, we will work ourselves out of business. And what's quite interesting is a number of the shops that have been supplying us have realized just how much they were wasting. They used to just chuck it all out and not look and think about it. Now they have to separate it out and put what's going to us in a separate bin to what's going into the pig bin. Um, and they're realizing just how much they're throwing away and how it can be used. And so the amounts we're getting from some of those shops is going down. So we are having an impact on them as well. But other shops are giving us more. So yeah. the, the paradox is the more successful you are, yeah. the, the less yeah. the, the food waste, yeah. so the, yeah. the less successful the cafe is. But, <laughs> yeah, I think it'll be a good few years before that happens. But yeah, we've got our community wind turbine, we'll do things with that. Do you think as you, as you develop as, a, as an organisation, as a business, that you will go more into other things? I mean, we had a discussion earlier talking about young people and whether young people care about food and whether they know what to do with it. We saw those young people there. Do you think in time, rather than say growing the cafe, you all kind of spread your wings into other areas? We, ha we presently have a business consultant funded by the Wales Cooperative Centre who's working with us to help us to look at how we might develop. Um, and training is a possible option, um, more training. Yeah, we, we're doing an event with we're doing an event with the co-op where they're they're focusing on waste food and we're sharing that. So I see us doing lots more events, um, focusing working with other organisations to get them to um, do quite a lot of the hard work. <laughs> Hi Chris, thanks thanks very much. Um, a couple of questions, really. One, you, you said that bookers supply you with, with um, their surplus food. Do you have any luck with the, the big four supermarkets at all? 
And, or is it a conscious choice not to engage with them? Yeah. The um, other big supermarkets are too far away. Well, Booker's is a fair way, but... Um, and we would disappear under a mountain of food. Now we're getting food from Booker's and the stuff from... A, a bit of stuff from the co-op. We're... <laughs> You should see our shelves and our stock rooms. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we, we don't really want to get too huge. Um, some of the hay funding we are going to use to um, set up um, uh, a system whereby we can have groups like after-school groups, community groups, a bit like fair share, and anything surplus that we've got, we'll be able to pass quickly onto them. They'll be able to go online and have a look at what we've got and come, because we are beginning to disappear under huge catering things of madras curry sauce and cheesecake mix. And this is another dilemma. There's huge dilemmas going on. The... Um, the carbon footprint of processed food is much higher, much, much higher than the nice carrots and parsnips and fresh stuff that comes through the door. And of course, all from local people, but our cooks aren't interested in your big jar of Madras curry sauce. They want the fresh fruit and vegetables and any fresh meat that we get. We don't get a lot, but we, we get a bit. Um, so they prefer to cook with that food and the processed stuff sits on the shelves. But as the people who are committed to carbon reduction are saying, we should actually be using the processed food more than the fresh food, because what do you do? <laughs> but we say we, we serve healthy meals, and the cooks say, well, that's not healthy, I'm not serving that. We did, though, last week, we had mountains of cauliflowers, and we'd got some big, big jars of bechamel sauce, so the cooks dealt with that and put some cheese in it and turned it into cauliflower cheese. So we did use the processed stuff, but that is a dilemma, because if you're getting stuff from the big supermarkets, you tend to get this big job lots of ambient food, processed. Question here. You, you sound as though you're doing amazing things across a whole range of um, aspects. Thank you. Affecting the carbon footprint and reducing surplus as well as working with young people. How do you measure the impact or evaluate the impact of all of those different dimensions? I'm thinking particularly because you're getting funding too, so I guess they ask those questions all the time. With difficulty. <laughs> Um, we keep a record of all the food that comes in, we weigh it, so we know during our first year it was, um, we um, stopped 100 kilos of food going to landfill. That wasn't what local people were bringing us because they wouldn't have sent that, they'd have composted, but that was just the stuff that came from the shops that we knew would have gone to landfill. So 100 kilos a week. And we cooked at least 50 kilos of it, and the rest would go for composting or to animal feed, as long as that was legally okay. Couldn't have come into the kitchen bit of the cafe uh, if it's going to go to animal feed. Can you quantify the impact that you're having on those young people's lives and on the, kind of the community benefits, as well as the very practical thing that you're set up to do? <laughs> on the young people's lives? Um, well... Um, the young people who've come through Jobs Growth Wales, it's, it's work experience, um, but it's not just that. It's, we saw those young people coming from school. Yes. I mean, that's thing. And they're a, with, they're a withdrawal group. And it isn't just the young people. We also have a number of people with learning disability or disabled. Um, and... For them, it's, it's somewhere where they're giving something meaningful to do. We always let them know, you've done four hours today, that's match funding for us, you've earned us, or whatever that is, 30, 26 pounds today. And you see them, you know, oh, I've, I've done that, even though they don't get it in hand. Um, so it isn't just work experience. We also put on, um, Environment Wales have funded... Uh, 
level two and level three hygiene courses. So all our volunteers um, and young people have an opportunity to go on those courses. But I just see them grow. I, I do. And we've got some long-term unemployed who, you know, it gives them something that's meaningful. So. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Because the cafe, all cafes in Fishguard struggle during the winter. We probably would only get a footfall of, of 15, 20 people a day during the winter. And that would be, you know, people maybe just coming in for a cup of tea and, and a chat. Um, so I'm not sure that the cafe is what the community asked for, but actually the most successful events are the specialist events, events where we focus on sustainability issues and people, and people turn up in their droves for those. We get bookings and have to turn people away. So. <laughs> It, yeah. it's been suggested to us and it's something we're, we're looking at um, as I say we're working with this business consultant um, to identify which would be the best options for us because at the moment um, our capacity, even though we've got 30 active people at the moment a lot of those people will do just half a day or a day so every week that the rotor is done, you know, it's, have we got enough people for this week? Some weeks it's fine, other weeks it's not so good. Um, yes, it's quite hard work, <laughs> the cafe. Um, we have had some people who've volunteered but really have found it too, too challenging. It's hard work running a cafe. Um, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and it will be really interesting to see how it develops. Thank you. Because you know, there's so many other openings that could come from it. Yeah. I think a lesson to all of us and all of our communities uh, what can be achieved. I know, I forgot, we just heard the surplus fish project. We've just got funding from uh, the EU to take the bycatch that the fishermen down in the harbour were throwing sell. away that yeah. they can't sell. And we've got funding to set up um, training sessions and workshops for the community. Okay. There's lots, there's lots we could do. Okay.